بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين We are speaking about this long series about the hereafter and last week we began our first session about the last section of this long series which is paradise we are talking about Jannah and last week we spoke about the last person that will enter Jannah the lowest level of the people in Jannah and we saw that even the lowest person can get what the eye has never seen and what ears have never heard and what hearts have never imagined and we explained that although in Jannah there are things that you can be familiar with in this world such as certain fruits and foods and sounds that you can familiarize yourself with in this world as mentioned in the Quran the Sunnah it is nothing like what you see and hear in this world for example an apple in Jannah when you say there are apples in Jannah you can familiarize yourself with apples you know that it's a fruit but is it the exact same fruit as you taste in this world like is it the most beautiful apple most tastiest apple ta best looking apple you've ever had in this world or can exist in this world no no apple can exist like the apple in paradise but it's an apple and we gave some examples and metaphors about that last week and whatever Allah mentions about the things in Jannah they are only merely an example to familiarize ourselves with it so that we can desire it because no one can imagine you can never picture exactly what is in Jannah you can only get an imaginary idea so therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he relates to us the things that could be in paradise to the names of certain fruits and, and, and pleasures that we have in this world but in that world it's beyond our imagination and we mentioned that whatever the heart's desire is different to saying whatever the mind can think in Jannah actually it's what the hearts haven't desired there is a difference between the picture in the mind because the mind can only think logical but the heart can think beyond that and we mentioned last week that in this world sometimes you experience a feeling and you're not you're unable to explain that feeling in words in the logical mind isn't that right it happens to us sometimes so therefore it's interesting that the Prophet Sallallahu used the following expression fiha in paradise there are things that no eye has ever seen no heart and no ear has ever heard and no heart of any human being has ever imagined not whatever mind or, or brain has imagined you can probably use the word mind here because mind has different definitions but whatever heart has even imagined for the desires of the heart are far more than the intellect of the mind isn't that correct this is only to illustrate how beautiful Jannah is how much we should strive for this Jannah that it's so worth it it's so worth it and today inshallah I want to begin with a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu quite important for all of us to understand and I start with a question are our deeds the deeds that we do in this life the prayer the fasting the donations and so on are our deeds worthy of paradise the question are our deeds worthy of paradise the answer is no our deeds are not worthy of paradise meaning can we say I worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a thousand years and now I deserve paradise because of my worship meaning is paradise equal to the worship is that its price is the worship enough to buy paradise 
No. In actual reality, there is no price that can buy paradise. There is no price that you can put on Jannah. At all. For example, a person donates $100 and says, with this $100, I deserve Firdaus now, the highest place in paradise. There is no equation. There is no equation. And evidence to this is the Sahih Hadith, which is in Bukhari and similar in Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ once said to his companions, لَن يَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةَ أَحَدٌ بِعَمَلِهِ قَالُوا وَلَا أَنْتَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ قَالَ وَلَا أَنَا إِلَّا أَنْ يَتَغَمَّدَنِي اللَّهُ بِرَحْمَةٍ مِّنْهُ وَفَضْلٍ No one shall enter paradise just because of their deeds. They asked a messenger of Allah, not even you? He said, not even I, except if Allah encompasses me with his pleasure and his mercy. What is the Prophet ﷺ telling us here? For the person who listens to this hadith, will find, will, it'll seem as though there is a contradiction. There is no contradiction. Even though Allah says in various verses in the Quran, you have received paradise as a result of your work. Bima amiltum. Constantly Allah talks about our deeds and then paradise. And He talks about salat and zakat and fasting. Then He says the result of which will be paradise. Is there a contradiction between the hadith of the Prophet and the ayat of the Quran? No, there isn't actually. Why? It's language. You've got to understand the context. A Rasul is not saying that if you, do, if you do good deeds, it will not earn you paradise. No, no, no. The letter B. B. لا يدخل الجنة أحد بعمله. No one will enter paradise be his actions. The letter here implies two meanings. It can mean the result of or in exchange for. So for example, if you want to buy a car, or you want to buy a house, or you want to buy a piece of garment that you want to wear, it has a particular price. And if it's overpriced, you say, this is overpriced, this is too dear, this is not what it's worth. So you want to buy, for example, a simple uh, 84 model Gemini for the price of a Lamborghini, you would say this is absurd. Or you want to buy a t-shirt that you find in the Kmart store as opposed to a t-shirt that's you know, made by a very expensive brand name and its material is quite expensive and you price them the same, you say to yourself this is not equal, this is not fair. You can't place... So in this life, we know what something is worth. But in Jannah, our deeds are not worthy of what's in store for us in Jannah. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? This is an extraordinary thing. This is a beautiful thing from Allah. This is a generosity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Although our deeds are not worthy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will multiply our deeds to be worthy in His subhanahu to Him. He will count our rewards enormous for Jannah. But what we actually do earn, therefore, is the pleasure of Allah, His generosity and His mercy when we do our deeds. And therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, take. Take from my generosity what you wish and more. Another question that I want to emphasize as well is worshipping Allah for the goal of reaching paradise and for the goal of being swerved away from hellfire, a correct way of believing? For example, some people, some sects of this deen have made a mistake in this belief. They say that the ultimate goal is to worship Allah just for Allah, out of love for Allah. Loving paradise, desiring for paradise, fearing hellfire has nothing to do with it. They say this is the ultimate goal. Our answer to that is that it is against, it contradicts the sunnah and it contradicts the desires of the prophets as well and the companions who are far greater than us. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of love for Jannah as well and out of fear of his Jahannam. The companions of the Prophet ﷺ worshipped Allah out of love for paradise and out of fear from Jahannam as well. And there are numerous ahadith and ayat in the Qur'an which tell us about this. Otherwise, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
describe Jannah in such absolute magnificent, magnificence? Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell the Prophet sallallahu what he has and what Khadija Radana would have, for example, in paradise and speak so much about it? Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, Inna Allah ashtara min al-mu'mineen anfusahum bi anna lahum al-jannah Allah has bought from the believers their soul, themselves, their bodies, in exchange that they will have Jannah. Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put that absolute pleasure, that in exchange for that, if it wasn't that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted us to yearn and desire Jannah and fear hellfire? This is the nature of the human being. Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us about a Jannah which no eye has ever seen or heart has ever imagined or ear has ever heard? Why would He give us these descriptions? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to worship Him for Jannah and fear hellfire. This is why we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah described what He has in store for us, we begin to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about hellfire, we fear His punishment subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that helps us in living a beautiful life, yearning the meeting of Allah. Nevertheless, the ultimate goal is to be in Jannah to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Jannah. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not let us see Him or meet Him except in Jannah. So our goal is Jannah. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, is our, we mentioned last week that in Jannah you get to wish for anything you desire, man or woman. And the question that arose the other week was the following, is our wishes in paradise unconditional? Like are we allowed to wish for anything at all? unconditionally for example are we allowed to wish to take the level or degree of someone else in paradise are we allowed to wish to have someone else's spouse in paradise are we allowed to wish for someone to be taken out of paradise can we wish for these things no we can't wish for these things and there are two reasons for that number one this is an injustice and in paradise there is no injustice. And number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised us that we will earn what we worked for. So if a person worked for the higher places in Jannah and they, they earned it, and a person worked and earned the lower places of Jannah and they took it over, then this will be injustice by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. In paradise, we don't say that you will not get what you wish, but rather we say you will be satisfied with whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. We don't say you will settle for what you have in Jannah, meaning Allah gives you this and that, so you have to settle for it. We say you will be overwhelmed with satisfaction with whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you, in any degree you may be. And therefore, it won't even cross the minds or the hearts of any individual in paradise to wish or will for someone else's degree, for someone else's property. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will satisfy the servants, and we spoke last week about ad, adna ahlil jannah, the one who is at the lowest place of jannah. What he will get or she will get, they are overwhelmed with satisfaction that their imagination runs out. We also mentioned last week that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, وَنَزَعْنَا مَا فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مِنْ غِلِّ and we will take out of their hearts all the negative desires. So no one will be jealous of anyone in Jannah. No one will, will, hate, will hate anyone in Jannah. No one will want revenge from anyone in Jannah. No one will remember the hardships, as in they will not suffer from the sadness or the pain of any hardships they used to encounter in the former life. All the negatives are gone and only the positives remain in Jannah. Which brings me to another question which is quite interesting. Will we in Jannah envy anyone else? And another question is, 
if in this life we enjoy certain luxuries and certain decorations because we get to show it off in front of other people will we have that same desire in Jannah? I mean what makes a person in this life like to look nice? What makes those people who desire looks and they're obsessed with looks to go and get surgery, plastic surgery and spend millions of dollars? Who do they want to impress? There are people who, are, who donate everything they have for that cause to impress others and they are driven to madness in impressing other people. But on a, on a normal scale, even us as normal human beings, not self-obsessed with image, we like to look nice in front of other people. Obviously this is a desire of showing off what we have. Uh, your wife likes to look nice for you and you like to look nice for her in order to increase the intimacy and the love and the affection and the desire and the attraction. At the same time, your same wife likes to wear attractive clothing to show it in front of her friends. And you like to wear perfume and cologne when you get out of home, for example, for other people to smell and enjoy. There is a difference between showing off in order to bring, uh, uh, in order with a negative feeling, like making others suffer for what you have which they don't have, and showing off in the sense that you like to share beauty with others. You like to look presentable. There is a difference between when you compliment your friend or your brother or sister because you sincerely love or you sincerely are happy for what they have. And when you compliment someone but you're really being two-faced about it, it's because you envy them, you're jealous of them, you hate what they have. There's a difference. And the Prophet ﷺ once said, don't show off what you wear. And one man said, Ya Rasulullah, a person likes to wear nice clothing and nice shoes. He said, Inna Allah jamilun yuhibbul jamal. Allah is beautiful, He loves beauty. What we are talking about is wearing it out of proudness. To belittle, to belittle others in order for you to climb above them in whatever that may be. Beauty or status or wealth or whatever it is. Nevertheless, we find enjoyment when we dress up to impress others in a good way or in a bad way. In Jannah, there is nothing in the Sunnah or the Quran or the Sunnah that neglects this. For in Paradise, there is attraction between the husband and the wife, the spouses, between you and others. You will meet other people that have greater nur, for example, in Paradise. Some clothing of the people of the above, the ones who are granted above you, and you'll meet them. And you will love what they have. And in one hadith it says that you meet them in places of gatherings and you begin to exchange nur from one another and you return back and you, sp you meet your spouses, men and women we meet each other, spouses meet spouses and they say you look more beautiful than before. Your wife says that to you and you say that to her. So obviously there is exchange, there, there is, you like to make an impression in paradise. However, the element, the negative element of it is taken away. What is the negative element? Envy, to have an envious feeling by not liking what the other person is having a luxury in. Wanting the good of the other person to be gone, being jealous. That doesn't exist in paradise. Did you not hear the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which is also Sahih and Muslim? He talks about people who love one another for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Al that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Al mutahabuna fi ala manabira min nurin yawm al qiyamah. The ones who love each other for my sake. And you may hate qualities in each other, but you will, you will neglect those bad qualities because that person is a strong believer in Allah and is a practicing Muslim. So you love that person for the sake of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa says, Al mutahabbuna fi, the ones who love each other for me, for my sake, will be in the hereafter on high towers of beautiful light. Yaghbituhum al nabi al shuhada wa al nabiyun. The martyrs and the prophets will envy them. 
What is this envy here? This envy meaning that the prophets and the martyrs, it will delight what they see in this person. It will attract their eyes. They'll love what they see. It will entertain their eyes. But not in the meaning of envious, in a negative meaning. That why have they got that and we haven't got that? Not like that. I was to talk about prophets and martyrs this way. يغبطهم, meaning they are attracted by what they see. They like what they see. They're happy for what they see. It attracts their attention. So for prophets and martyrs who have what they have in paradise, it's beyond what we can describe. You know, you think to yourself, what could there possibly be anything for the martyrs and, 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 and prophets in paradise to be attracted more than what they already have? Let me give you a, an example in this world. If you say you are a famous person who has all the wealth of the world and anything you desire, you have everything that every man or woman can desire. You might say to yourself, this person, there is nothing that they will desire more. So no matter how attractive you, you look or what, what you may have, will not attract them more than what, because they already have things beyond what you can possibly afford. So the barters and the prophets, you say to yourself, in paradise what they have, there is nothing that can possibly attract them more than that. Yet, here we have a hadith of Prophet telling us that there will be something that they will look at and they will be surprised with. It will attract their eyes, but in a good way. Say, wow, it's like this, wow, that's really, that's something magnificent. I'm happy for you. Really. The martyrs and the prophets will envy what they see, meaning they'll love what you have. It will attract them to say, this is something, this is something worthy. So therefore there is that in paradise, but in a good way. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best about its deeper description. There is a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is also sahih, that in paradise there are degrees. And in the Quran it talks about degrees in paradise. And each person will be delegated their own degree in accordance with the amount of struggle and effort that they put forth in this life of goodness. The struggle and effort is not in itself what earns you the degree, but it is what emanates from your heart when you do that act. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. An example of him. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَا فَاقَكُمْ أَبَا بَكْرٍ بِكَثْرَةٍ مِّن صَلَاةٍ أَوْ صِيَامٍ أَوْ صَدَقَةٍ Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu did not exceed all of you because he did more prayers or more sadaqah or more fasting than any one of you. Some of you could have possibly done a little bit more than Abu Bakr in actions. ولكن, but it was شيء وقر في قلبه وصدقه العمل. But it is because of something that he reached in degree inside of his heart, in here. And his actions confirmed it. So some acts, you may be praying for example next to another person. And that person's prayer, you're praying the same prayer. You look, mashallah, pious in the same way. But this person, what he is feeling inside, or she's feeling inside, may be something that earns them greater rewards than you while you are praying the same prayers. This is something of how you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the degrees are given to you in paradise in accordance to this. And the Prophet ﷺ said, the people of the lower heavens, or of the lower paradises or gardens, will look above to the people of the higher degrees. And the way they will see them, their properties, will be so far of a distance, like the way one of you sees the stars in the sky. You know, when you look at stars in the sky, this is how they will be in their degrees. Some people really high. And therefore, the Prophet ﷺ used to say, when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ask for al-firdaus al-a'la, always supplicate to the highest places in paradise. So there are degrees in Jannah. But will you look at that and envy it, saying, why has this person got it? I wish it was for me. No. You'll be satisfied with what you have. But will you be allowed to see what they have? Yes, you will. Will you be allowed to go? Can you wish to go and meet that person up there, to go into and visit them? Yes, you will. You will even be allowed to wish to meet the Prophet Muhammad Imagine that. Imagine 
that you're in paradise and you say, I want to sit with the Prophet for a few long moments. Why am I saying moments, not years or days? Because in Jannah, there, are no more, there is no more time that you can count. There is no more time that you can count. There's nothing you can say day or night, years. In fact, you don't need to. For you have all the time, endless time. And there is nothing to rush to. You don't have to make an appointment with someone, like in this world. In paradise, it's made easy. No appointments. No you know, restriction of time. And the Prophet ﷺ can see everyone at the same time as well. And you can see everyone at the same time if you will. In a way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can make it for you. So if you want to wish to meet the Prophet وسلم, you can meet him where the Prophet وسلم, is. Where he is. Up in the upper heavens. Up in the upper paradises, if you want. And you can sit with him and speak with the Prophet وسلم, and see him. Al Rasul وسلم, told us, Man ra'ani fil manam, faqad ra'ani haqqa. Whoever sees me, or kama qal, whoever sees me in their dreams, then he has really truly seen me. Meaning, you are going to see me in the hereafter. You are going to meet me in paradise. You are going to be with me, insha'Allah. Insha'Allah. So if you meet the Prophet وسلم, in paradise, imagine you're sitting there. And ask him whatever you wish. Ask the Prophet ﷺ whatever you want. All those hadiths that you read, all those stories that you read about the battles and the meetings of the Prophet ﷺ and the affection of the Prophet ﷺ and his family and uh, things that you heard about, you want to know them in reality. You can there, sit there and ask the Prophet ﷺ about it all. You can sit there, imagine in paradise, and you want to meet your family members that have surpassed you in good deeds and they have earned higher places. Can you meet them? Yes, you can. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim, bismillahir rahmanir rahim, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَاتَّبَعَتْهُمْ ذُرِّيَّتُهُمْ بِإِيمَانٍ أَلْحَقْنَا بِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَمَا أَلَتْنَاهُمْ مِنْ عَمَلِهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ And those who believed in this life and they died and their offspring they follow them in the same belief they will be reunited in Jannah they will be reunited in Jannah but those of their family members who are on higher degrees will not lose their rewards they won't lose their degrees meaning when you are reunited it's not that those who are in upper degrees will come down and lose their degrees to be reunited with you. Nor will you use your, lose your degree or whatever you have to be reunited with your family. Reunion in Jannah means that you will meet and visit and spend time with them as much as you like. I'll give you an example in this life. We all have family. But is it necessary that when I say to you, you are united with your family in this life, does it necessarily mean that you all live in exactly the same house, in the same room, sharing the same bed? No. You have your father, your mother, your uncles, your aunties, your spouses, your children. You can be united, but in separate homes. You can even be in separate suburbs or in separate countries, but you still communicate, you still visit. Isn't that right? And you have that communication. So you are united. In Jannah, this is how the reunion with the families will be. You get to visit, to sit with, to communicate, to meet, to go on journeys, to fly together if you like. You want to fly together in Jannah? Let's take a flight. You don't need any aeroplanes. You can have horses in Jannah if you will, with beautiful wings made of pearls and whatever you want. And they can talk to you if you like. And you can fly on these horses. They'll fly like birds, if you will, if you wish. You can have carriages, which you and your spouse will sit in and have as many horses as you like. Forget about Santa Claus and his reindeers. In Jannah, you'll have something beyond that. If this is what man can imagine and draw for you and animate for you on television, then imagine when, Allah, when the Prophet tells us what no heart has ever desired. In Jannah, it'll be beyond your imagination. Imagine that. So the meetings in Jannah are always there. You'll meet people and you will see, but you will not be jealous and you will not wish for others to lose what they have. But rather, 
you will be delighted of what you have. So you'll get the pleasure of enjoying what you see. You know, sometimes you don't really need to go anywhere far to enjoy yourself here in this life. Put your family in the car and just go off to somewhere nearby to enjoy the view. Take yourself, you know, if, if you're driving somewhere, there, there are lookout points, yeah? And you just stop there and you look out in Allah's world. Just by looking at that beautiful nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings happiness and delight into your heart, right? Even though you don't own any of it. But just looking at it. So in Jannah, getting to look at your family and your friends and other people's properties in Jannah is a delight for you. But obviously there are some things that you'll be restricted from. There is a hadith from Prophet Sallallahu where he says in his dreams he ascended to, he went into heaven. He really saw it Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said, I saw before me a beautiful woman like none I, I has ever seen. And my heart desired to come and meet this woman, Ar Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But then I heard that she was Umar ibn al-Khattab's wife, radiallahu anhu. He said, so I turned away. Now, Umar ibn al-Khattab is hearing the Prophet ﷺ saying this. And, the, and he began to cry, radiallahu anhu. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Ma yubkika ya Umar. Because Prophet ﷺ said, I, I, I walked away, you know, maybe Umar ibn al-Khattab will feel, you know, the ghira. That, you know, you're coming, <coughs> this is my wife, that feeling, that protectiveness. And Umar ibn al-Khattab here, he cried. And the Prophet ﷺ asked him, يبكيك, يا عمر, What's making you cry? He said, أغاروا, يا رسول الله. Am I going to feel the overprotectiveness over my wife because of you, O Messenger of God? How will I ever feel like that? I will never feel ghira against you, Ya Rasulullah. أغاروا عليك يا رسول الله. It's something, يعني, wallahi, that we can never be in their status. أغاروا عليك يا رسول الله. So the Prophet ﷺ is speaking about Jannah and what you can see in Jannah and you are restricted from certain things in paradise. Your spouse is your spouse. Their spouse is their spouse. And no one will wish for someone else's spouse. You'll be satisfied with what you have and you will love them and adore them. Men will love their women and their women and the women will love their men. Now last week we had a particular question what does paradise mean and where did it come from? In Arabic or in the Quran and Sunnah, you will often hear the term Jannah being said. Tilka al Jannatu, allati wa'id al Muttaqun. That is Jannah, for which those who protect themselves from the displeasures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will enter. I don't like to use the word fear, those who fear Allah, because you can misunderstand. Al-Muttaqoon meaning those who guard themselves from the forbidden things out of love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't want to displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with you. So you love Him so much, you prove it by abstaining from the things that He told you. Stay away from it. You actually prove that love this way. As Muslims, this is what we are taught. Paradise in English actually is derived from the word, or is it the other way around? Paradise sounds like the word Firdaus. Firdaus means paradise. Paradise means Firdaus. It's an ancient word, even before the Prophet Muhammad was sent. It was used with the Hebrews. The Jews used it. The Christians used it way before. Isa Isa, Musa Isa, the prophets before, Ibrahim Alayhi Salam, way before, they used the word Firdaus, paradise, Adin, Eden as well. In the Quran, we hear a new term called Jannah, which means gardens. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or what is the wisdom behind the word garden? Well, you see, brothers and sisters, who was the Quran first revealed to? Which type of people? The Arabs in the deserts. And how many gardens do you hear of in deserts? Not many. In fact, gardens in deserts for a Badawan or an Arab living in the desert is something they can only dream of in those days. In our days, it's a little bit different. But in those days, an Arab living in the desert is only something to dream of. Gardens of greenery. When you say garden, you think greenery. Green, vegetation, fruit, waters and fountains, rivers. You think of 
relaxation of the mind and the spirit, sitting, hearing the, the, the stream of, of rivers, traveling as though they are beneath your feet, the sounds of harmony, birds and animals around you. Everybody, when they think of that image, think of that feeling, whether you are living in the desert or not, it's a harmonious feeling. In fact, when you see ads on television talking about beauty, let's say shampoo, for example, they often accompany it with the sound of streams, greenery, birds. Isn't that right? This is one of the ways that they attract you to that experience, the experience of nice smelling things, pleasant things. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks Jannah, garden, for the first time in the Quran to Bedouins and to Arabs in the desert, it tells us that Jannah, Allah subhanahu wa describes it in ways that appeal to every single human being in any given circumstances. So in ancient times, it's Eden, the gardens of Eden, or it is called Firdaus, paradise. In other times, it is called Al-Khul, Jannatul Khuld, the life of eternity, or Al-Ma'wa, the place of residence for eternity. There are many different names to paradise. And we are only given a small amount of names and descriptions of paradise in the Quran and the Sunnah to illustrate to us that no matter what you want, it will be there. For any person, whether you are a Bedouin living in the desert who desires greenery and water, you will get it. Or whether you already live in greenery and water, you will get other things that you desire beyond your imagination. If you think this greenery and water is what is beautiful on this earth, then there are things beyond that imagination. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses every person in accordance with what they desire. In other words, anything that you desire, you will get. Anything that you lack in this world, that you would have wished for in this world, you can wish for it in Jannah. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the reasons why we hear the word Jannah, gardens. Just so that to clarify, some people might say, well I have many gardens, I've been to beautiful streams. That's going to be boring, what's, what's there in Jannah? only to tell you that you will have whatever you wish for that you couldn't get in this life, you will get it there and beyond that imagination of course. And whatever you already do have in this life, if it's described in the same way, then in Jannah it's beyond what you think. If you thought you saw it all, think again. Another question, often women feel that they are left out when we speak about the property and the pleasures of paradise. As though the Quran and the Sunnah, it seems as if it's only addressing the men or often addressing the men and leaving the women out, such as referring to Hur al Ain, the women spouses of Jannah, addressing the men in the masculine term. We find that a lot of women usually ask the question, well, what about us? What do we get? One brother said to me, well, I heard that women will be the most beautiful of women in Paris. That's their reward. Is that really the only reward women get? And another question is, do they get property in paradise like the men get property? The answer is yes, of course, of course. It is not your choice that Allah created you a man and a woman a woman. And it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who guaranteed for us that if we strive towards paradise, we will receive the reward, men or women. Because Allah subhanahu wa spe specifically mentions men and women in various chapters in the Quran. Men and women who do good, men and women who pray, men and women who fast, they will have. And then He unifies the reward. In the Quran, a person, a brother asked me, not in the Quran, a brother asked me, do women have property? Yes, they have property. Do we not hear the verse in the Quran, in Surah Al-Tahrim, where the wife of Pharaoh, who was tortured and embraced Islam in secret, and while Pharaoh and his soldiers were torturing her, she said, as Allah says in the Quran, وَامْرَأَةَ فِرْعَوْنَ وَامْرَأَةَ فِرْعَوْنَ إِذْ قَالَتْ رَبِّ بْنِ لِي عِنْدَكَ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنْ فِرْعَوْنَ وَعَمَلِهِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنَ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ And the wife of Pharaoh, when she said under torture, O oh my Lord, build for me a 
castle, a palace, a house, with you in paradise, and save me from Fir'aun and his actions, and save me from the oppression of the people who oppress. Is there a property for her or not? Of course there is. Is this property only for the man? No. She is a woman. And I want to allure your attention to something very important here. Till I get rid of this fly that's bugging me. SubhanAllah. Doesn't want me to talk about paradise. Paradise, there's no bugging flies, by the way. Sorry, the wife of Pharaoh. We hear of her being the wife of a majestic king. He has everything. In fact, he went to the point of saying, I do not know any other God but myself for you. Don't you see the rivers are flowing beneath my command? The Nile River, I order it as I will. She had everything. She had everything that any woman will desire in those days. Like anything tangible that you can touch, that you can feel. She had the most luxurious homes, palaces, that they could imagine in those days. Yet here she is, saying, Oh my Lord, build me a palace with you in paradise. There is double the reward here. Number one, a greater palace than what she could imagine in this life. Why is she asking for a palace? It's like she's saying, what I have here, my Lord, is insignificant. It's rubbish. It's nothing. I want one with you. The second reward, I want it to be near you. So now, a woman not only gets property in paradise, but she gets to be in a location close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does that mean? We don't mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a location. A'udhu billah. Allah is beyond location, time and space. However, for He is the creation of location. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, she is saying, I want to be near you. Meaning me as a person, I want to be in a place where I can be near to you in feeling. And I can see you. And I can speak to you. So put me wherever in Jannah. But I want to be near to you. I want to speak to you. I want to see you. I want to meet you, my Lord. So that whenever I will, you are there. Subhan. Rabbi ibn li bi andaka baytan fil jannah. This is what she said. Another question. Since men can get many hur, some hadith state 70, 72 maximum, the minimum will receive two wives in jannah. And we will talk, insha'Allah, about the descriptions of these women in Jannah, insha'Allah, in later classes to come. But for now, the women will ask, what do we get? Do we also get many men in Jannah? First of all, I'd like to just pay your attention to something very important. The nature of the man and the woman. Obviously, Allah says, وَلَيْسَ الذَّكَرُ كَالْأُنثَى The male is not like the female. Our wishes and our desires, in fact, in our, our intimate desires, our sensual desires are very different. And our biological makeup is very different. Will our biological makeup be the same as it is on earth in paradise? Obviously not. But you'll still be male and female. Allah knows best. The man desires many women in his nature. And a man will not say this to his wife. But you don't find women saying, I desire lots of husbands in this world. This is the nature of them, how Allah has created them. The woman is more conservative than the man, generally speaking. Honoring and respecting this modesty of the woman, the Quran and the Sunnah does not concentrate on speaking about the, the husbands of the, of the women in paradise and how beautiful they are and attractive and so on and so forth. This is out of respect and modesty for the nature of the woman in her conservativeness in this life. This does not mean that she will not get spouses in paradise. Also, it does not mean that she will get more than one spouse, either way. However, the scholars do differ. Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi says, I think it's Ibn al-Qayyim, I said it last week. He says that they will have whatever they desire, meaning it's possible that women may have more than one husband in paradise. Now in this realm of this life, here in this world, it doesn't make sense to us to talk like that. In fact, it's very embarrassing. It's very rude 
for a woman to even ask the question or a man to say, you will get lots of men in paradise as your husbands. For the conservative or for the uh, modesty, for the sake of modesty, it's, it's, it's not nice to say something like that to a woman in this life. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not even say that for the woman in the Quran or in the Sunnah. But he speaks about the men because of their natural desire and inclination for that. In paradise, it is not fornication. It is not adultery. The one who made marriage allowed in this life and for us to enjoy close intimacy, as you know, we consider it okay, is the one who will make it okay in paradise. There is no fornication or adultery. Allah subhanahu wa says, وَزَوَّجْنَاهُمْ بِحُورٍ عِينٍ and we will make them marry or we will marry them to, to women of beautiful lustrous eyes and also the women will be married to extremely handsome men this is based on the hadith of Prophet when the spouses meet each other the husband meets the wife and the wife meets the husband after going on a journey and coming back they say you are more beautiful than what I saw you before and in another hadith the wife says to her husband in Jannah and the husband says to his wife, there is nothing in this paradise more beautiful and enjoyable to me than you. And she will say the same thing to him. But there is only one thing that is more beautiful than all of this, my brothers and sisters in Islam. The greatest beauty in Jannah and the best thing that anyone can ever receive is the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeing him and meeting him and speaking to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine yourself entering Jannah in the lowest degree and you have been given what you have been given and suddenly you have two spouses one more beautiful than the other no envy no grudges no jealousy none of what we feel here in this life you are of a different form and shape different feeling in paradise and you sing to one another there is music in paradise there is music in paradise that is far more beautiful than any music anyone could ever have imagined in this life. It is the music which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created for you. The one who created the melodious tunes in this life is the one who will create far more magnificent melodious tunes in the afterlife. The one who created beauty in this life and some, be some beauties dazzle us is the one who will create magnificence in beauty in the afterlife. So work towards it, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam. There is no grudges or hatred between the husband and wife in paradise, between the spouses. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa describes the features of the spouses in paradise they describe them in a particular feature so the form of the people in paradise are described in a particular form Rasul tells us you will be in paradise the height or similar to the height of your father Adam alayhi salam 60 arm lengths into the sky of perfect form of beautiful form on the shape of your father Adam alayhi salam. Adam alayhi salam is the most beautiful being Allah has created. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he created him with his hands. Laysa kamithlihi shayt wa huwa al basir. There's nothing like unto Allah and he hears and sees all things. And he is of the beautiful form. So we will be like him in paradise. But we will look exactly the same? No. Each person will look different to another. And there are some who are more beautiful than others. Some men are more handsome than other men and some women will be more beautiful than other women. On top of what women will get in Jannah of property and whatever they wish for and desire, on top of that, their beauty will be far more beautiful than the most beautiful of Hur al-Ain in paradise. Hur al-Ain in paradise literally means Hur al-Ain. Hur. Hur denotes to the white part of the eyes, the white part of the eyes. 
But when you say Hur, it is beautiful whiteness in the eyes. Ain, meaning referring to the eyes. So they are lustrous, big, beautiful. And it talks about the color of the eyes on the inside, the pupil or the iris, is absolute darkness in black. It's absolute pitch black. It's a rarity in this life. Does that mean that every Hur'in will have black irises? Even though it's a rarity in this life, you know that, yeah? Black irises in this life, pitch black, is a rarity in our life here in this earth. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger mention to us of this particular description? Is it because it's of one type, one form? No. He also mentions whiteness. It will be white, fair-skinned. Does that mean that every woman, every man in paradise is fair-skinned and white? No. Does that mean they're blonde? No. Some will be, others won't. It's impossible to think this way, even though the Quran and the Sunnah does describe them in that form. But what it, Because then you'll have a problem. The Quran does not support nationalism and racism. There will be a problem with color. And also some people don't desire white, some people desire dark. But then again, who was the Quran first sent down to? The Arabs of the desert. The Arabs of the desert are dark in feature. And the most desirable look to them, the men especially, is the clear whiteness of large eyes that are large and big. What I mean by large, not like a cow. <laughs> I said once to some students, big eyes. They go, what? Like a cow? No, not like a cow. When you say big eyes, you know what we mean. Beautiful, long, extremely attractive eyes. Absolute whiteness, no red veins in there, no red arteries, no uh, blemish, nothing. And then the iris comes in so beautifully. It says blackness. It is a rarity to the Arabs as well. Fair skin, a rarity to the Arabs of the desert those days as well. So because he was addressing the Arabs first, the Meccan verses, the verses that describe the Hur al-Ain, most of them are Meccan verses. In Mecca. The men in Mecca wanted to stop the Prophet ﷺ, kill the Prophet ﷺ. The men in Mecca, they mistreated women. There was a lot of, there, there was mistreatment of women. They degraded women. A lot of them buried girls when they were born. They had prostitution as well, and it was also everywhere else in the world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them, instead of resorting to this, I will give you in return many beautiful women in paradise. They are called Hur al-Ain. Now when the Arab Bedouin hears this, what happens to him? He desires it and stops from bad behavior, mistreating of women in this life in exchange to get the most beautiful of women they can desire in the hereafter. <coughs> Similarly, if you desire a different color, you can get that different color. It's not restrictive, my dear brothers and sisters. Nowhere in the Quran and Sunnah does it restrict to a certain type. But what it does say, meaning whatever you desire of looks, it will be there. And here is an example, in other words. Here is an example. When the verses came down in, the, in, in Medina, the Madinan verses, You'll find that the verses, if you look it up, you'll find that the verses no longer address the spouses as Hur al-Ain, but rather they address them as spouses. Wazawajnahum or Azwaj, spouses, paired up. So you find that the language changes a little bit as people change. Therefore, I hope you learn this lesson, inshaAllah, the point or the context of this is what that you desire that which attracts you. Here is an example for the Bedouin Arabs. We finish off insha'Allah, we have five more minutes and insha'Allah next week we'll continue with this. But I'd like to finish off right now to ask a question. With all the beauty of paradise, who are the people of paradise? My question is not who are the people in paradise, my question is, right now in this life, who are the people who will go to paradise, insha'Allah? In accordance with, our, with what Allah subhanahu wa has told us and what the Messenger sallallahu has informed us about a paradise, its dirt is made of rubies and sapphires and its inhabitants wear only the finest silk garments. Sounds like a pretty exclusive neighborhood, doesn't it? 
Who are these people who will be allowed to live in this enchanting place? The Jews say, the Jews. The Christians say, the Christians. But Allah says, and they say, لَن يَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُودًا أَوْ نَصَارًا None shall enter paradise unless he be a Jew or a Christian. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replies to that. تِلْكَ أَمَانِيُّهُمْ Those are their vain desires. قُلْ هَاتُوا بُرْهَانَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Say, produce your proof if you are truthful. Allah also says, namely, those whose lives the angels take in a, in a state of purity, saying to them, peace be upon you, enter you the garden, because of the good which you did in this world. So those who die in a state of purity. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always mentions those who will attain paradise. He mentions the believers, not the Muslims. The believers, al-mu'minun, not the muslimun. Muslims may enter hellfire, but al-mu'minun will not enter hellfire. Indeed, the muttaqoon will be amongst the gardens and water springs. Those who guard themselves from the things which Allah has forbidden. He also says, verily the muttaqoon will be in a place of security, among gardens and springs, dressed in fine silk and also in thick silk, facing each other. This is how it shall be, and we shall marry them to huris with wide, lovely eyes. They will request therein for every kind of fruit in peace and security. So again we see the word muttaqoon. Allah says, they believe in Allah and the last day, and they enjoin what is right and forbid the wrong, and they strive with one another in hastening to do good, and those are among the good. He subhanahu wa ta'ala also says of the believers, but the apostle and those who believe with him strive hard with their property and their persons, and these it is who shall have the good things, and these it is who shall be successful. Allah goes on by saying, Allah has purchased of the believers their persons and their goods, for theirs in return is the garden of paradise. They fight in the cause and they slay and are slain, a promise binding in him in truth through the law, the gospel and the Quran. And who is more faithful to his covenant than Allah? Then rejoice in the bargain which you have concluded. That is the achievement supreme. Those who struggle and strive in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with everything they have. Paradise is for them, my brothers and sisters. And lastly, there was a man, his name was, and I finish it with this insha'Allah, Umayr ibn al-Humam al-Ansari radiallahu anhu. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would often describe paradise to his companions. And this was one of the cases as Anas narrated, when, his, when the Prophet and his companions proceeded towards Badr and arrived there before the disbelievers of Mecca, when the disbelievers arrived, the Messenger of Allah said, None of you should step forward ahead of me to do anything. Then the believers advanced towards us. And the disbelievers advanced towards us. And the Prophet said, Rise to enter paradise, whose width is equal to the heavens and the earth. Umayr, stood up and he said, O Messenger of Allah, is paradise equal in width to the heavens and the earth? And he وسلم, said, Yes, Umayr. Then Umayr said, Bakhin Bakh, an Arabic word denoting excitement and astonishment. The Prophet وسلم, then asked, What made you say these words, Bakhin Bakh, Ya Umayr? And he said, O Messenger of Allah, nothing but the desire to be amongst its residents. And he وسلم, said, You are surely among its residents, Ya Umayr. He then took some dates from his bag and began to eat them. Then he said, If I were to live until I had eaten all the dates, indeed this life would be too long. Anas then said, He threw away the remaining dates he had with him, and he then fought in the ranks of the Muslims until he was martyred. Narrated in Sahih Muslim. The martyrdom is injustice, of course fighting injustice and protecting the innocent. This was their desire and insha'Allah this is our desire. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us what we desire for which is Jannah and to unite us in al-firdaws al-a'la with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ameen ya rabbil alameen. Hada wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.